Good afternoon, folks. Welcome back to National 5 Chemistry. Let's see if I can get it right this time. Um, we're covering metals and electrochemistry. Basically, it's all covered under this heading of metals and their properties and reactions. It covers quite a lot. It's SQA pages 59 to 64. So this is going to be a biggie this time. But like usual, I'll try and put it into chapters and you can spin on to the bit that you're interested in. Four quite separate things, really, um, but all fall under the heading of metals. In fact, these things. There we go. And I suppose these things as well, eh? Slightly different variations. Metals are really handy, to say the least. They literally took us out of the caves and off into space. Um, so I think we should start with what on earth holds the atoms in this ring, which my lovely wife made me as a birthday present a couple of years back. What holds the atoms in this silver ring here to each other? Why do they stick to each other? What's the bonding situation behind them? Because it's unlike anything else. Um, this is a picture from Wikipedia, which is Creative Commons, so I'm just going to show you it nicely. So this is how the SQA loves to represent metallic bonding. Just above it, what I'll do is I'll draw a typical representation of uh, a magnesium atom, for example. Magnesium has got 12 protons in the center. It's got 12 neutrons in its nucleus as well, although they're not too interesting in this case. So they have zero charge. Uh, and of course, it has got 12 electrons separated up into three layers. So electrons here, two, eight electrons in the next layer. And that leaves, if you can count correctly, that leaves us with two electrons left over because, of course, um, in an atom, there are the same number of electrons as protons. However, you've Hopefully, if you've seen the bonding stuff, um, you will realise that the atoms of this magnesium uh, are not happy because their outer layer is not full up. So the same would apply to the silver in this ring. The question is, how, if there are no other elements around, how do we make these atoms happy? What they actually do is they simply throw off these outer two electrons and now you're left with 12 positives and only 10 negatives. So we've effectively created ourselves an ion, a 2 plus ion. Where do these electrons go? If this was a compound, they would go and join up with the non-metal. But it's not a compound. It's a chunk of metal. So these electrons, as shown hopefully in this diagram, simply wander around freely between these ions that you've created. So these are the positive ions, which is the nucleus and the remaining full layers of electrons. That's what this is in this diagram here. And these electrons here are the delocalized electrons. The magic word delocalized electrons means that they are no longer tied to a specific atom. And they literally just wander freely in amongst this sea of positive ions. That's how it used to be described in textbooks. Delocalized electrons in amongst a sea of positive ions, whatever that means. You could imagine this as being ball bearings glued together by blue tack. If you imagine a series of ball bearings, depends how good your visual imagination is. It's actually quite a good model because it explains some of the physical properties of metals. Um, once upon a time, the SQ wanted you to know some words to describe the physical properties of metals, but they're only really interested now in one property, which is electrical conduction. Because if you have all these electrons free to wander, I uh, hope you can imagine that if we popped another electron in here, it would go dong 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 dong, complete the sound effects, and follow out the other side eventually. The consequence of this is that metals are excellent, all of them are excellent conductors of electricity because I don't know if you know this or not. If you're not a physics person, you might not actually know this, but electricity, as in the stuff that's powering this video camera and my phone, is simply a flow of electrons. So you can see something that lets electrons flow through it, like this, is by definition a good conductor. So I think that's as far as we want to go with metallic bonding at National 5. Come back at higher, we'll look in slightly more detail. So that's the nature of metallic bonding. In fact, it's a weird situation where there are the atoms kick off their outer electrons and you're left with these delocalized electrons wandering around between positive ions. Let's have a look at number two, 
which is reactions of metals. You're required to know three reactions of metals. Let's go and set that up right now. I'll just write it out so you don't get bored watching me do it. Okay, so let's look at these three reactions here, guys. Metal plus oxygen is reaction number one. This applies pretty much to almost all metals. There are a few exceptions like gold and platinum, but pretty much all metals will do this. Uh, and it makes, very simply, a single thing. It makes a metal oxide. That is it. Can't get much easier than that. If we were to take a real world example of this, uh, if I was to, let's go with iron. So iron plus oxygen. And the question would, because this is a transition metal, of course, the, if the question was asking you to create this equation, then the question would need to tell you what the valency of the iron in the iron oxide is. And let's go with iron three oxide, why not? So iron three oxide. So iron's valency in this case would be three. Oxygen's valency, of course, it's in group six, so its valency is two. We swap these over and you get Fe2O3. Uh, this, of course, is one of our Hofbrinkles, so we need to write it in pairs. This is just uh, iron. I'll try and put a link up here to my video on how to construct formulas of almost any compound, just in case this has slipped your mind. So there we go, nice and easy. Let's do the second one, metal plus acid. This makes two things. This makes a salt uh, and hydrogen gas. I have promised to stop saying a eh and um so much. I do apologize if I do that. So metal plus acid makes salt and hydrogen gas. Again, let's take a real world example of this. This, by the way, applies to um, fewer metals, but still a great many of them. Um, I'll show you which ones it applies to just in a second. It used to be required knowledge that you used to have to know which metals would react with acid. That has been taken out of the course in recent years. So let's just say many. And an example of that would be, let's go with magnesium. And hydrochloric acid. Now, uh, I'm just about to try and make a video for the acids and bases section. So again, if I remember, I'll try and pop a link up here in the corner to it. Magnesium and hydrochloric acid. Well, if I'm making hydrogen gas, that comes from there. So that is a Hofbrinkel, so we write it as H2. And magnesium and chlorine, well, magnesium valency 2, chlorine valency 1, swap them around, MgCl2. And that's it, we're done. You might find some old texts which call this an example of neutralization, but they're wrong. If you're interested, it's actually a redox, but don't worry about that, we don't need that anymore. Let's do the last one. This applies to very few metals. It applies specifically to all of group 1. Group 1 are all pretty bonkers, and they will react quite happily with water. They react, I think if you put them in a room, they'd react with themselves. Um, it applies to some of Group 2, perhaps, things like magnesium, the more reactive ones. But don't worry about that. Uh, it definitely applies to all of Group 1. And what do we make in this case? Well, we make something called a metal hydroxide. And as you may or may not know, metal hydroxides are alkali. That's why group one are called the alkali metals, because they literally turn the water alkali and also hydrogen gas and a bucket load of energy in the process. These are genuinely scary because they sometimes go bang and you never quite know why or when. Rather, let's do an example of this. Let's do sodium plus water. Sodium plus water, well, metal hydroxide. Hydroxide is one of our complex ions. So you get it from the data book, page eight, if I remember correctly, the table with the complex ions. That's going to make a sodium hydroxide is OH. Being an old fart, I always put complex ions in a bracket because I think it makes it neater and less subject to mix up. And hydrogen gas. Sodium valency one. Hydroxide valency is the same as its charge, which is one minus. So we're done. Those are the three reactions in brown, the general patterns there, and in purple, three specific examples for the reactions of metals. Just before we leave this, by the way, we can put the metals in order of reactivity. And this gives us 
what are called, or what is called, sorry, dodgy grammar, the electrochemical series. Now that is on page 10 of your data book, folks, and it looks like this, which I can't fit on the camera in one shot. Sorry about that. Uh, the most reactive metals are at the top here, pretty much, and it tends to get less reactive as you go down. That's actually a slightly dumbed down version of reality, but it's close enough for our purposes. So most reactive at the top, less reactive as you go down. This will figure um, in three significant ways in this video. Number one, its order of reactivity. We'll come back to two and three uh, in the very near future. What did I say I was going to do next? Extracting metals. Let's do that. Right. Let's have a look at getting metals to play with and making things out of them. We have been walking around this planet in our current form for about 100,000 years or so, possibly more than that, actually. But we have only had metals to actually build things out of for the last 8,000 years or so. The question is, what was the delay? Well, there's a very simple answer to that. Almost all metals on this planet do not exist as elements. You don't wander across the Sahara randomly finding chunks of aluminium and iron. Instead, they are locked up in the form of compounds. Now, these metal compounds are shockingly common. In fact, they're stones, basically. Most stones that you come across on this planet are actually compounds of metals. But unfortunately, like all compounds, they are pretty tightly bound to each other, and it's not all that easy to get them apart. So we actually needed to do probably our second oldest chemical reaction after setting fire to things. If we didn't know how to do that, we wouldn't be still around. Our second oldest chemical reaction, we're fairly certain, is turning rocks, uh, uh, ripping apart rocks and getting metals out of them, extracting metals from them. Another name for a rock that contains a metal is an ore. As in Minecraft ores, yes, Minecraft actually isn't actually lying to you. How about, well, it's lying to you sometimes, but um, a little bit of chemistry in Minecraft is true, as we are about to have a look at in the very near future. Let's have a look at three different ways of getting a metal compound, splitting it apart, and turning it into the pure metal element. Number one, just heat the ore. Now, this only works for the lowest reactivity metals. So if we have a look at our list here, I did say the lowest ones were at the bottom. So we have gold, mercury, and silver. So what the SQA are saying that if you have, for example, mercury oxide, which is HGO, I think HG2O, if I remember correctly, tends to be mercury one oxide. If you simply heat that up, don't react it with anything else, just heat it up, it falls apart, and you make mercury, element, and oxygen gas. So that is true for metals up to and stopping at silver. So it works for, by the way, the SQA, as they frequently do, are actually talking the complete rubbish because you don't find gold oxide. This is one of the very, very few metals that you do actually find as an element. That's why you can find chunks of gold if you go panning for it in Alaska and certain areas of Scotland as well. So this is actually found as the element. Um, but that's beside the point. Let's pretend the SQA are right. So this works for gold um, and mercury and silver. It does not work for anything higher in reactivity than silver because these guys are all far too strongly stuck to the oxygen to want to just let it go because you've asked nicely with some heat. So that is our cutoff for simply just heat it up. So these ones here, silver, gold, and mercury. Let's have a look at method two. Okay, method two. This time we're gonna use something a bit more technical. We are going to react your ore with something which is going to rip away the oxygen and leave you with a bare element metal behind. And the two chemicals the SQA want you to be aware of, used to be three. Um, we've cut it back down to two these days if you're interested. The third one was actually hydrogen, but that's just for interest. Carbon and carbon monoxide. This is a solid, of course, and the last time I checked, carbon monoxide is a gas. 
Let's take a look at an example. Which metals does this work with? Well, if we were to take a famous one, which is in the blast furnace, then we can start with an iron oxide. Whoops, we can cook it up with carbon. Excuse me, a little fruit fly floating around here. Um, and we can make our bare iron and this teams up with the oxygen to form a nice stable compound, carbon dioxide. If it had been carbon monoxide, by the way, I'm hoping you can still work out, it makes the same things. Still makes carbon dioxide. Which elements does this method of extraction work with? Well, we are starting at copper in blue, um, and we are working our way up. The SQA want you to realise that it works all the way up to and including zinc. And that's the cutoff. So copper, lead, tin, nickel, iron, zinc. Um, this is what we think was discovered by accident about 8,000 years ago uh, by some geek in the Middle East. Probably when throwing uh, rocks into fire for fun because it made the flames go green. See, copper ores tend to give you green flames. And the same geek must have been poking about in the ashes the next day to find little chunks of pink copper. Uh, I'm hoping, if you've been in my class, we've certainly had a go at doing this. I'm hoping other classes will have had a go at this as well. Recreating our second chemistry experiment from 8,000 years ago. And it works all the way up to there. So I suppose that leaves us the question of these guys at the top, the most reactive, the bonkers metals, how are we going to split them apart from their ores? Let's have a look at method number three. Okay, method three is by far and away the highest tech method, which explains, by the way, why we have only had aluminium for a couple of hundred years. Um, and in fact, when it was first made, aluminium, one kilogram of aluminium was worth more than one kilogram of gold. Um, because it required the brand new fangled technology of electrolysis, which you can't do unless you have electricity, which has only been with us for a couple of hundred years. In fact, there's a quite nice history crossover. If you know a place called Foyers up in Loch Ness, there was the very first aluminium plant in the UK. 1896, it opened. The buildings are still mostly there. They're used for something else now. But it's quite cool. If you haven't been in to have a look at them, that was the very first place in the entire country, up here in the middle of nowhere, that we actually um, made aluminium by releasing it from the rocks. So what's going on here? Well, the bonding in these metals at the top here, these metals at the top are so tightly attached to their compounds that the only way you are going to break those compounds apart is to melt the compounds and then blast them with electricity, which is what's going on here. Um, there isn't really an equation for this. Uh, it's more just a process. And uh, that's our three methods of extraction of metals. Uh, as you can see, the extraction method varies depending on the reactivity. Can we just summarise again here using this sheet? So in green, we had, if I can find my green pen. Who stole my green pen? So in green, the metals down the bottom here, silver, mercury and gold we have some sort of weird modification of the Nike slogan. Just heat it. That's all you need to do. In blue, we have got the most chemistry-ish one, perhaps, um, where we react the ore with carbon or carbon monoxide. Uh, and the metals at the top here, if you want to extract them from their ores, you have to melt and then electrolyze. By the way, the melting, of course, you need to melt these uh, because solid ionic compounds don't conduct electricity. So that's why you need to melt them first and then zap them with electricity. Pretty extreme. And that's why these are most difficult to get. And that's, of course, why these are actually surprisingly valuable. From an environmental point of view, by the way, metals should never be thrown away. Metals can be recycled infinitely. Um, so please take care of your metals. There's only a certain amount on the planet. What was the next plan there, guys? Uh, so, metallic bonds, done. Reactions of metals, done. Extraction of metals, done. Which just leaves us with electrochemical cells and redox. Let's have a look at that. 
once I find some fresh paper. Okay, what's an electrochemical cell? To the rest of us, it would be called a battery. Um, and what goes on here is you have got two metals. They have to be different metals. They have to be sitting in a solution that conducts electricity, which is otherwise known as an electrolyte. So basically any ionic compound. So a dissolved ionic compound is an electrolyte. It's just a liquid that conducts electricity. When the two different metals are sitting there in this electrolyte, if you pop a voltmeter between them, you find you get yourselves a voltage. That's the idea behind it. What you can also do is you can actually separate this into two beakers, which seems a bit weird at first, and you have the first metal sitting in an electrolyte, and you have the second metal sitting in an electrolyte. Now, if you hook a voltmeter up at the moment between these two, you get absolutely nothing, because as you can see, the circuit is not complete. So we need a way to complete the circuit. Now that is completed by using something called an ion bridge. Now the clue is in the name here, because an ion bridge allows ions to move, which is nice because it's just triggered the second thing I was going to tell you about these, which is that when I say electricity is flowing, what do I mean? Famous trick question by the SQA. Electrons flow through these metal wires. If you remember at the start of the video, we talked about that. So electrons flowing through metals. That's a flow of electrons there. Electrons do not flow through the ion bridge here. Electrons flow here. So what flows through the ion bridge? The answer, clues in the name. The answer is ions flow through the ion bridge. You, the good news is you don't even need to know which direction um, they flow in or anything like that, so I'm just going to call a halt on that and say the function of the ion bridge is to complete the circuit and allow ions to move between the two beakers. And now, ding, we get a reading on the voltmeter. A third representation of these cells, these batteries. Actually, if you're interested, by the way, a battery is a combination of multiple cells. Um, but we're not going to go there. We'll leave that to physics to worry about the details. So a third representation would look like this, guys. You have got, um, this was known as a YouTube long before, actually we had the YouTubes on the internet. So you'd have, uh, get the color code right here. Sorry, that's metal one there. What did I use for metal two? Pink. That's metal two. Our voltmeter was between them. Uh, and this is all electrolyte in here. However, the electrolyte can't just touch, so they use the iron bridge. The iron bridge in this sort of representation can actually be a plug of cotton wool or something else that's porous. I'm a total donut. I forgot to tell you what the iron bridge would have to be made of. It has to be a porous material, like paper or cloth. It can't be made of glass or plastic. Um, or metal, obviously, because ions can't flow through solid objects. So um, it's typically filter paper here, and it can be anything you like that's porous, so cotton wool or something along these lines for here. So that is our ion bridge. Um, and these are filled with electrolyte. That's just dissolved ionic compound. Why can you not use pure water as an electrolyte? Because it doesn't contain enough ions, is the simple answer to that. And then, yep, you'll get a reading on your voltmeter now. Um, two more things I'd like to cover before we leave the cells behind. Number one, what affects the size of the voltage that you get from this battery or this cell? What affects the size of the voltage? And which direction do electrons flow? Because in my previous example, I just randomly decided to have them flowing from the brown metal to the pink metal. 
but there is a way to know. Guess what? It's the third way that we're going to use page 10 from a data book. Speaking of which, I think this is sufficiently scrappy that I'll get myself a fresh page 10. Excuse me for a second. And here is our nice clean page 10. So two questions I said we had to answer. What affects the size of the voltage you get from the battery and which direction do electrons flow? Well, here are the two answers for these questions. If you have any of these two metals, for example, tin and copper, uh, then the size of the voltage is affected by the distance between the two metals on this list. The further apart the metals are, the larger the voltage you get from your cell. It doesn't matter where they are on here, so zinc and iron are right next door to each other. That means you'll get a tiny voltage from zinc and iron, in the same way as you would get a tiny voltage just from these two. Despite these being high reactivity metals, that doesn't affect the voltage. The only thing that affects the voltage is the gap between them. So I suppose the ultimate battery would be between lithium and gold. Wonder why we don't use golden batteries? Mm, bit expensive perhaps, but this metal here, by the way, this of course, if you don't know, is used in every single rechargeable battery in the phone that I'm using to make this video and all your laptops, they're all lithium cells because it's as high as you can go. Um, so that is the answer to number one, the distance between the two metals. The larger the distance, the larger the voltage. The smaller the distance, the smaller the voltage. So that would be a much lot better battery than that. Which takes us to the second question, which direction do electrons flow? The SQA love to ask this. They love to ask you to draw on the diagram which direction the electrons flow. And I made a joke with my classes. I say, this is like a beautiful waterfall. As in, a waterfall falls from top to the bottom. And that is the direction the electrons move. So, if you have a battery involving aluminium and lead, for example, then the electrons will flow from the aluminium to the lead. So if we keep the same colour code as we ultimately had in my first diagrams, let me find the first diagram again. There we go, we had brown, so aluminium would have been brown, and pink, I've lost my pink, there we go, would have been lead in this particular example. The electrons are flowing that way. If we hooked up a battery of copper and gold, then the electrons would flow from the copper to the gold. I was going to talk about redox, but this is a long enough video as it is, so I'm going to stop right there, um, and I'll see you perhaps in the next video, folks. So, can I put my original learning intentions back again? Let's pretend to be a professional, eh? So, I want to talk about metallic bonding, reactions of the metals, how to extract metals from the rocks and their reactivity, and electrochemical cells. It turns out redox is going to have to wait to another day. There was one last thing that I would like to talk about just before I leave this. The process of electrolysis. Actually, I know what I'll do. I'll come back to that in the next video. That's perfect. Electrolysis and redox lend themselves to a single video. Thank you for listening all this time. Hopefully this has been of some use. Bye-bye, folks.